you guys some background. Uh, the last year that we have data was uh, 2014, and there were 1,107 major data breaches, 10% in education. That added up to 51.3 million records stolen from uh, schools, and that's schools and universities. That's a ton. A lot of it comes from hackers. A lot of it that, that in education, though, wasn't necessarily hacking. A lot of it was people on the inside and then just people losing data because it gets lost sometimes. But at the same time, that's, that's a ton of records. A lot of it is ID theft. They're going to want, more importantly, is your health information. It's worth a lot more. It's worth 6 to $10 per record per time it's, it's uh, bought. So that's why your, your data is, is worth so much. Today we're going to talk about three different, three different subjects. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is public data. Public data in our, our policies is called directory data, but we like to call it public data. It just makes sense because these are the things that you can share publicly. Now, not that we want to just give all this information away, but these are all things that can be shared. Artwork and coursework displayed by the district, you guys can publish that stuff. We, <clears throat> I don't think as a district we've really pushed that that much, but that is legal to do. Here's the, here's the weird one, and that is photographs, videotapes, digital images, and uh, recorded sound. And then this is where it gets weird. Is, as long as it's not harmful and not a, an invasion of privacy. Now that's where you know, your invasion of privacy versus what I think is an invasion of privacy differs, and so we just kind of shy away from it. Uh, and that's why we, um, we don't necessarily want you to post uh, videos and photos of everything that goes on in your classroom. Even though these are publicly legal to, or excuse me, this public data is legal to share, there are factors in place that could keep it uh, illegal, and that is that we allow our students and our parents to keep the stuff private. And we have a form that they can sign every year. If you need to have access to that, the office can show you how to do that. The next group is sensitive data. This applies really more in, at secondary level, but there are a few things on here that are sensitive that you guys have control of. Dates of birth are sensitive data. They should not be shared publicly, but they can be shared within groups. So say like inside of your classroom, probably don't want to send a, a list of birthdays with years home to parents. But if you wanted to put like, you know, April 7th is Jill's birthday, that'll work. But as long as you don't put the year. User IDs, that's going to again be their email address in, in our district, so it's kind of, it works as both. Uh, but these are things that we don't want to share publicly, but it can be shared within the district. This is where the real hard stuff is. This is the stuff that we don't want to share. This is our restricted data. And again, all of this will make sense. Obviously, social security numbers, addresses is on there to protect students, and that's part of FERPA, the federal law. Their MOSIS ID. You guys don't have access to their social security, but you do have access to their MOSIS ID. Everybody does, for every student. And so we have, that's probably the, the biggest one that we've got to protect, and that is kind of the social security number in Missouri, because schools, uh, you can go from one school to another as long as they have that number and get your information. Obviously, health data for students and for any staff that you uh, come across that health data that is supposed to be not shared at all. This is an iffy one. Grades and test scores. How many of you guys like to post good grades that happen in your classroom on the wall? No? Good. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys aren't. How many of you guys like to post uh, work that's not graded, but you like it's an exemplary work, and you want to put it up on the wall? That's perfectly fine as long as the grade isn't showing. And if you want to be super safe, block out the name. By the way, most of the stuff I'm going to share with you here in a little bit is, is going to be the most safe way to do things, not necessarily very practical or the way that we do it in the district. This is just the most safe that we could, we could come up with. Next thing, your parent and guardian names. This goes back to FERPA again. This is to protect students whose parents uh, may not want another parent or somebody else in their family to know that they're there. And so we need to protect that information. And so we can't share well. You know, Jill's dad is Jim. 504 uh, disabilities, obviously, aren't supposed to be shared. Discipline records. There's some good discipline records to read out there. I promise you that. They're good stories to tell. Please don't tell them, even, even in the, you know, teacher's lounge. All right, race and ethnicity we'll talk about in a minute, and it'll make sense why it's on there. 
witness protection information. You guys remember Kindergarten Cop, the movie back in the 90s? Yeah, same reason why it's, I don't know if it's why it's in federal law, but it is a part of that. So if there's witness uh, protection information, you, you need to keep that secret. Criminal investigation information. That stuff is restricted data. Be careful with those things. This is, this is where it, this is kind of a weird statement, I know, but this is the way it, it uh, is stated in the law. And that is that any of the things that we talked about on, um, I don't want to go through all that, but any of this public data that connects back to any kind of restricted data, uh, even though it is legal to share that public data, is illegal. My example is, is that if you have a class that only has one female, and you have all the rest are males, and you do grades by gender, then you'd be able to figure out who had the grade. Same thing with race and ethnicity. So uh, that's why those are all on there. All right, here's, here's the real meat of it. Here's the things that we can do to protect our data. And again, a lot of this is obvious, but some of it's, some of it's new, some of it's not. Uh, number one is be aware what data to share and what not to share, and that's what is in your handout. So we try to get all of it on there. Second thing is verify the identity of staff members who are going to work on anything that has access to any kind of student data. How many of you guys know who your building tech is? So if you don't know people, what's the best way to figure that out? Ask them. Ask them. They all have IDs. All right, next thing is phishing. How many of you guys have got a phishing email or been to a website that it wasn't real? Got phone calls or text messages. There are people trying to get your information and buy things. How many of you guys like to sign up for coupons everywhere and get free stuff online and you never get it? But, but all that stuff, you're giving away information and people are going to get it. Uh, ensure that your password's strong. We'll talk more about that in a minute. This one we've, we've hopefully solved with the lab logins now, but not using your own login for a student. Anybody who has access to your login has access to your H drive, your T drive. Google, especially if you got how many of you actually save your username and password on everything so it just automatically loads and you don't have to remember it. How many of you like to save your passwords in a list of some form or fashion? Yeah, lots of people. Uh, people put it on their, their notes on their phone. They put it on a Word document or something like that or a Google Doc or something. Probably not the safest thing to do and I'll tell you why here in a little bit. Uh, how many of you guys, and this will come up again later, but how many of you put it like on a post-it note next to your computer screen? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's not do that anymore. How many of you think that think the next step, you're like, well, it's not on my computer screen, but it's under my keyboard. <laughs> not any more safe, just so you know. Just because it's not in sight doesn't mean that people aren't smart enough to flip keyboards up. So, again... Memorizing your password is probably a good idea. If you're not a good memorizer, you can use Excel to make those lists and then password protect a, an Excel file. Uh, it's a really good, cheap way to do it. But then, you have to, but then you only have to remember one. Yeah, 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 you do have to remember one still. But you only have to remember one. And then, that way you, got, you can put all of them on there and then it's pretty safe. There's also different things online that you can get. Uh, LastPass is a good one if you want to pay money for it. But. This one, turning off and logging off of your computer, obviously it logs off every 20 minutes now, but um, yes. <laughs> but a good practice is to turn off your computer every night. That way you can ensure that uh, people can't log into it, um, especially if you're leaving for the night because you, know, you, you, you shut it off, you leave, you don't have to wait for it to go off by itself or log off by itself, and so that ensures that last 15, 20 minutes that you're not in the room that it's safe. So... Um, no, but they should be turned off about once a week just to make sure that they get the updates. Because if you don't log off every once in a while, it'll, like, it'll catch and it won't log up automatic, uh, up, update automatically. So If you get an unex uh, unexpected attachment on an email, you don't know what it is, don't open it. We can't really download anything. The only thing that we re can really download are Google extensions. And that's anything that you can add to Chrome to, to better its functionality. Kids like to put games on there, and those games sometimes have malware or phishing stuff that, that pops up. And it, they don't really do anything, but they're just annoying. All right, this is where we're going to get to some, like, some 24 hacking 
safety stuff. If you guys have ever watched 24, it gets pretty ridiculous. How many of you have noticed in the last three or four years that you get on a website and it says HTTPS instead of HTTP? The HTTPS is the secure form of the internet, and what it does is it changes everything that goes over it and encrypts it and, and makes it safe that way. And then on the other side, they unencrypt it. If you're going to be putting any kind of student data in something, make sure that it is an encrypted website. Second part of that is, and this all has to do with encryption, is if you're going to be at Starbucks or wherever there's free Wi-Fi, try not to access any kind of student data um, or send student data. That means email information that you send that has student names on it, anything like that. And so if it's not secured, you know, we got to watch out for that. And so tips for creating a strong password. You guys got this earlier this year. Uh, in an email that I sent you, um, but our password uh, specifications here at CAPE are pretty strict, and they, they follow this, and that is that you have um, uppercase, lowercase, number, and symbol, uh, and that they're at least eight characters long. I think in the last email that I sent you, there was a link to a website that you could actually put your, um, you could put your password in, and it'll tell you how fast that they could hack it. And if it's all lowercase, it happens in less than ten, a tenth of a second. Yeah. You, you add uh, an uppercase. Actually, if, if you add a number without a, an uppercase, it's still less than a second. Uh, and so that uppercase is really important because then it bumps it up to like a day. And then if it's up to eight characters plus that symbol, it's like 200 and something years. And if it's longer, the longer it is, the better, obviously. So... Uh, if you guys want to read that sometime, they get even more specific. They make sure that you don't put full words. Um, I think I sent a list of the, the most commonly hacked passwords. I mean, some of them are pretty stupid, honestly, password. People are still doing that in 2016. But just a reminder, your passwords are going to be changed every 90 days. We just went through this, so you guys saw that. Um, can't contain your first, last name, or your user ID. And again, just another reminder, please avoid writing down your passwords or giving them to other people. All right, now let's talk real quick about um, restricted data that's not necessarily on a computer. It could be paper, it could be anything. So obviously avoid duplicating and giving away information that you don't need to, especially things with like IEPs. If you make copies of them, make sure that you keep them safe. Shred everything that has student data on it. Don't just throw it away. We all have shredding boxes that we can throw stuff in. So, How many of you guys have a locked place in your classroom that you can have control to lock? A few of you. All right, when you guys are going to send mail, please don't put sensitive information or keep safe or something that's going to say, hey, I, maybe there's something in there that I want to read. All right, avoid storing restricted information on any kind of a, a flash drive or CD or DVD. You guys can put your worksheets on there. You can put videos, stuff like that. Anything with student data, please don't put on, uh, on a device that can be easily stolen. I mean, that's how the military gets hacked, and they make the news all the time. If you're going to print something to a, a printer that, you know, if you're going to print to the copier, you've got to have your password and stuff. But if you're not, make sure you can get to that information very quickly. Same thing for faxes, which we'll talk about in a second. We want everything to be... Password secured and encrypted, which it is. If it's on your H drive or if it's in Google or Gmail, it's going to be encrypted. So all of that's password protected and encrypted, so we're safe there. If you have a file that you want to be encrypted or have a password on it and you don't know how to do that, just call us and we'll, we'll help you out there. And same thing with fax documents. Pick them up as soon as possible. If you're going to leave a voicemail message with a parent or some other organization, you're going to be talking about any kind of restricted student data, please don't leave it on the voicemail. You don't know who's going to be picking it up on the other side. All right, email. This is more of a reminder than anything else, and that is that your emails don't belong to you. They belong to the school. So if, you, if you're using it for uh, your Amazon account or um, your Netflix account, anything like that, the school has all that information. Please refrain from using it improperly. This is a, a reminder. How many of you guys have ever scanned something using the copier and then you have it emailed it to you? You guys know you can do that, right? If it has restricted data that you wouldn't email, don't use that. Because we don't think about it. We're just like, oh, we're just scanning this and we're giving it to ourselves. Well, if you're not gonna, if you don't want it to be in your email, don't 
don't scan it. Uh, how many of you guys use like a third-party app like Kahoot or uh, Brain Pop? I don't know if you guys use that over here or not. Any online games, stuff like that? Class Dojo is, a, is another one. If you're unsure whether or not it is safe to use, just contact me. I, I can look really very quickly and, and see. I got a list of different ones. Like Class Dojo is obviously safe to use. Uh, we've been using it for a while. This is for uh, from the tech guys, and this is going to change after I get everybody trained on this. We're going to switch over. You're going to have somebody here at this school who's going to be your password person. You're no longer going to call over to tech or email tech and get your password because we can't verify who that person is or if it's actually the right person emailing from that account. So can't call either. So we're going to have somebody here. If it's in the summer and there's nobody here, you can go to the central office, and Carrie Latimer is our registrar, and she can do that for you as well. If you lose your password to something like Classroom Dojo or Class Dojo, don't call tech. It's a third party. They can't get it, all right? It's unless, I mean, you can go back in your emails and figure, you can do the forgotten password thing. You guys know how to do that. If you think you got hacked, I don't want you to go around telling everyone, hey, I got hacked. This is awesome. <laughs> because what that person's going to do is like, oh, guess what? This other person got hacked. Guess what? You may not have actually got hacked. You have to do two things, and that's it. Number one, you need to tell the tech department. You can either dial 1234 or email techdepartment at capetigers.com and say, hey, I might have got hacked. Can you guys check? Just because someone logged into your email doesn't mean they actually got into any sensitive student data, even if they had full control of your email. Anybody ever had like weird emails get sent from your, your email? Okay, you change your password, you're safe. That actually, it wasn't a real hack, but say somebody gets into the system and they, you know, they get into like Infinite Campus or something, that would be a real hack, and then we have to verify that. What happens though is we have to tell the FBI, we have to tell state police and local police, and then eventually we have to report it according to the law. And so we need to verify that. Second of all, tell your building principal just for informational purposes. They're not going to, they just, if something's happening in their building, they need to know. And for our librarians, I cited my sources.